You're dyslexic. Yes. You learned that at a really, a pretty young age. And that carried you a long way. Yeah. It makes you so emotional. Why is that? Definitely. Oh, excuse me. I just, I think of those days. They were very tough times because I was, I was really uh, wondering if I was ever going to make it. I re it was, it was, you know, those were very tough times. I was failing. Uh, there was a lot of panic in my own family. Um, my teachers weren't sure, and I knew it was a, uh, it was, I was very lucky. I was very lucky. I, I was dyslexic and very, and very much so. It was very challenging for me. I couldn't read in the early ages and it really affects your, your reading score and it gets you pushed back. But there was a woman named Marjorie Golick who's very famous out of a University of McGill with Sam Rabinovich and I became part of an experimental class. They were testing um, an idea at the time. Their thesis went like this. You feel so weird when you're dyslexic because and I can still do this, I can read upside down, I can read in a mirror. And what Marjorie said was, look, this is not a fault, you have a superpower. And when you're that young, you buy into that, it gives you the confidence you need. And that's what occurred to me. She gave me that confidence. And I meet lots of dyslexic people today and I give them encouragement because it's, it is a superpower. Uh, Neil Simon called me up and said, would you read my play out loud? D um, just read it so I can hear it. Oh my God. I, I found 50 or 60 ways to talk my way out of not doing it. And then I thought to myself, as I have done many times, you either take the challenge or you're full of it. You either dive in and do this, or who the hell are you? I went, I read it over and over and over again. I yellowed it, I highlighted it, I wrote, I read it one word at a time. I could not read it out loud. If I had to read, uh, the, the, the lines out loud. Uh, we sat around a table Monday morning at 9 o'clock um, uh, for the, the producers and the directors and the, the, uh, the prop people and the costumers and everybody had to know what, ooh, what, what is my job this week. So we read it out loud. Couldn't do it. Stumbled over everywhere. I screwed up other people's timing so those people were angry. I took a little more time and so those people were angry because they needed to get out and get on with getting the props together for the, or build the set for the show. It was horrific. If I concentrated, if I was focused, when we were doing Happy Days, we would do, um, uh, have a script, a white script, a yellow script, a golden rod, a green, a blue, a yellow, Right, the revisions. And all the revisions. And then on Thursday night, there are times when they would rewrite almost the entire script from Thursday to Friday morning. We would memorize three scripts a week. It got to where I could rub the script on my, on my mind, on my head, and it would go in. Quite an amusing story uh, is that age 50, uh, we had the biggest private group of companies in Europe um, and, uh, and I had a board meeting and, uh, and in the board meeting uh, somebody gave me some figures for one of our companies and I said, is that, is that good news or bad news? And one of my directors looked at me and said, Richard, you don't know the difference between net and gross, do you? And, and, um, and, and I went, okay, well, you know, I hadn't admitted it to anybody, but I, I didn't. 
you can build the biggest group of private companies in Europe without knowing the difference between net and gross. Um, uh, because, you know, what is a company? A company is simply creating a product that makes a difference to other people's lives. And if you can create, you know, a better company than other people that make a difference to other people's lives, the money will come in and then you can find somebody else to count the money up at the end of the year and hopefully more money's come in than it's gone out. Uh, you know, from my 20s, um, I started talking about the fact that, um, you know, that I discovered that I was dyslexic um, and, uh, and I did it on purpose because I think um, it's important for uh, other, you know, especially young kids who've been told that they're dyslexic to see that, uh, you know, that, that successful people, um, you know, can get through it and, uh, and that, you know, if they follow their particular dreams, they follow what they're good at, uh, that, you know, that they could be, they, they can be even more successful at what they're good at than, than, than others. So, um, and there are so many people like myself who've excelled in their, you know, individual prof um, professions um, uh, who, who have been dyslexic. So I think, it, I, think it I think it's really important that, you know, people who are dyslexic get, get out and talk about it. Yeah, five years ago I was diagnosed as having been dyslexic for my entire life, and um, which explained a lot of things. It was like the last puzzle part mm -hmm. and a tremendous mystery that I've kept to myself all these years yeah. that basically started with just things that happen when you're a kid in school and you're a slow reader. Yeah. And in my case, I was actually um, in a uh, unable to read for for at least two years, uh, I was two years behind the rest of my class. And of course I went through what everybody goes through, is teasing. Yeah. And I had to go through that for a long time. And so the teasing, you know, led to a lot of other problems I was having in school. But it all stemmed from the fact that I was embarrassed. And I was told to stand in the front of the class and open my book and read from the book in the third grade. It would, yeah. it, that day would be another long day in a long series of the worst days of my life. I was a member of, of, of the Goon Squad sure. when I was a kid uh -huh. growing up. But all of my friends, as it turns out, as we all grew up, they all had different kinds of, of um, disabilities. They, they, had, they had different kinds of dysregulations. Mm -hmm. And we all had a lot of stuff in common, uh, not the least of which several of us were dyslexic. And dyslexia, of course, was the first thing that sure. led me to realize that I was different, although yeah. I didn't have a name for it, I just knew that um, I, I dreaded going to school. There, there were teachers that didn't quite understand why I, 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 was, I was so behind the rest of the class and my reading skills and talked to my parents about it, but there was, there, there was nothing, you know, we're talking about the 1950s, yeah. and there was, there was not a program, that was, there, there were not books There's being nothing. written yeah. about dyslexia. Nobody diagnosed me as being dyslexic, and so all they could do was assume that I wasn't studying hard enough, that I wasn't mm -hmm. reading hard enough, that I was perhaps uh, lazy, yes. I got bullied, I dealt with it by making movies. Yeah. I mean, making movies was my... That was my cover-up, and, and, and other times, and, and, but I never felt like a victim. That was the important thing. I never felt like a victim. I think movies really helped me, kind of saved me from shame, from, from guilt, from putting it on myself when it wasn't really, you know, you know, my own burden. It wasn't my burden, right. and I think making movies was my great escape. That's really how I was able to get away from yeah. all of that, and, uh, and I'm just saying that in, in, in light of feeling a little bit like an outsider, yeah. Movies made me feel inside my own skill set. You know, kids before they start to see themselves f from, you know, the point of view uh, of others, can be really, really harsh, yeah. really, really mean. Yeah. And 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 they don't, they can't help it, and they don't even know they're being mean. Exactly. Yeah. You know. So it, as an adult, I can look back and and I don't have it because I wish I had somebody helping me to understand that there were many, many others like me. 
Mm -hmm. And even my own friends who we weren't even able to articulate what was going on in our lives. I, I know uh, several of my friends were just like me, mm -hmm. but we didn't have the skills to talk to each other about it. Sure. And I wish I had somebody in my life then that was really able to do an intervention and get yeah. me through those rough years. And the other thing is, I'm in a business right now where reading is very important. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's of critical importance to me that I read books and scripts. And, scripts and, yeah. and, 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 uh, and so I've been able to overcompensate. And I just basically, with, no, with never feeling ashamed of myself, yeah. will take, you know, two hours and 45 minutes to three hours to read 120 pages. It takes me about two hours, 45 minutes to read what m most people can read in about an hour and 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I just know I'm still slow at reading, but I've learned to um, adjust. I just don't, I read often, yeah. but I'm, I'm very, and here's a great thing also, I have great comprehension in what I read because I do read slowly. Mm -hmm. I retain almost everything I read. I don't just skip over things. Yeah. And I'm able to appreciate the writing. I'm able to kind of really savor good writing yeah. because I really take my time going through a book or a script. Mm -hmm. Just that it's more common than, you th than, than, than you've ever could, could imagine mm -hmm. and that you're not alone yeah. and that uh, there are ways to uh, ac accelerate your reading skills, to accelerate your comprehension and there are ways to deal with it. It's not an incurable thing. It's something you're gonna have the rest of your life, but you can sort of, you know, dart between the raindrops to get where you wanna go. Yeah. And it will not hold you back.